So if, if I'm on the, uh, let me see here. Um, yeah, well, hopefully that audio thing will be better. You know, I might ask people somewhere uh, in the middle of the. Um, yeah, if they can hear us. Hear us, okay. Um, yeah. But uh, good. I think we are good to go. Um, awesome. <clears throat> yeah, uh, welcome everybody to Mid Current Interviews Live, where we talk to expert anglers, authors, and personalities and give you a chance to ask them questions in real time. I'm Marshall Cutchin, publisher of Mid Current. Today we're joined by Nathaniel Linville of Key West, who is a multi species saltwater record holder and fly shop owner. Nathaniel opened his store in the Angling Company. Uh, in Key West on Simonton Street in 2009. And since then, he spent a lot of time fishing the Lower Keys and South Florida. Um, Nathaniel has, uh, by my estimation, I think by most people's estimation, become one of the most dedicated and technically proficient saltwater anglers in the world. Um, he most recently set a new six pound tippet record for tarpon uh, at 140 pounds, which is really uh, extraordinary. Um, before we start, I wanted to remind you that we're watching live on Facebook. You're watching live on Facebook. You can comment and you can add questions in chat. Uh, we'd love for you to ask questions about uh, permit fishing or tarpon fishing or whatever, bone fishing, anything you anything you want. Um, and, and please also, if you're watching, invite your friends uh, to join. Um, if you're watching this as a recorded version, um, welcome uh, to you as well. So, Nathaniel, uh, yes. what's the most what's the most fun day of fishing you've had recently? Um, that's a good question. Um, <clears throat> I fished today. Um, fished today, maybe a month ago. With uh, it's hard to it's hard to pick. I, I fished today with John O'Hearn uh, a few months, ago, maybe a month ago, where we caught a big tarpon and a giant permit, and then we caught a, a mutton snapper on the flats, and uh, that was probably and oh, and we could not for the life of us find a bonefish to catch to complete um, whatever kind of uh, whatever kind of slam that would be, um, and we just had a good time. Super, I think that's a super stress. grand slam. It, it, it might have been, yeah. If we had been able to catch the bonefish, it would have been something. But it was, it was, it was great, and we had a good time. And um, we were actually looking for the mutton snapper, which was it didn't just happen to us, uh, which made it feel like somehow more premeditated. But um, yeah, it was a really fun day for sure. Marshall, I can't hear you. Sorry about that. Yeah, I'm, I'm back. I was going to say, just catching a mutton snapper on fly these days is quite a quite an accomplishment. Yeah, there's not many of them around like there used to be. From what I hear, and I've not seen it, but uh, mm -hmm. it, it was fun to be looking for it. And of course, everything on the flat, I was, you know, in, delighted in telling John that you know three barracuda was a, a, a school of mutton snapper. And um, but cool, we saw this thing and we caught it, and it was it was a lot of fun for sure. When did you first get interested in fly fishing? Um, I mean, I, I got serious about it about 10 years ago. Um, I mean, with the opening of the shop, um, but I, I've been doing it my whole life. Um, my mom got me into it when I was really little and um, it was never something that I, I could remember not doing. Um, we started freshwater fishing and then got into saltwater fishing probably in the early 90s. Um, and I've just been doing it ever since. Um, were your, your first, you caught, you caught some saltwater fish before you moved to Key West, so, right? Yeah. Lived in the Northeast? Yeah, striped bass and bluefish yeah. and, um, you know, what we call bonita, but our, uh, false albacore. Or no, what we call albi is your false albacore, which is called bonita here, and green bonita, um, and, uh, the occasional bluefin tuna, but that was not, we had to move around out of, I was in Long Island Sound, so we had to go up to like Cape Cod or Massachusetts to find those. Gotcha. So, um, permit is one of your favorite fish to fish for. Um, Steve Huff calls them a dishonest fish. <laughs> what do you think about that? 
Um, uh, you know, I it's funny. I think that I think that permit on a per shot basis are pretty honest, actually. Um, I mean, if you look at a day of tarpon fishing where you get, I don't know, 20 or 30 shots, 50 shots, um, and you hook, I don't know, five to six or seven of those fish, that'd be a really good day of tarpon fishing. If you had 50 shots at permit, um, I think you'd probably hook more. I mean, it would depend on you know, look, if, if you're counting every fish in each school that you throw at as a shot, which I think some people probably do, or each, you know, each time you throw into a school, you multiply the number of times you throw by the number of fish in it, then the shot number goes way up. But, but per sort of opportunity, at, you know, there's a group of three permit and that represents one, one shot. Um, I, I think, yeah, they're, they're pretty unrelenting. If you do something wrong, they'll, they'll, not tolerate that, but, uh, I, I don't, I don't necessarily share that opinion. I, I think that permit, if you, if you really do everything right, um, chances like the, the few times that I like do everything right. If a fish doesn't eat it, I, I tend to think I'm really confused about, about what went wrong. Um, and it leads to that sort of like, I can't, you know, you're, you're racking your brain to figure it out. Um, whereas if I throw a fly at the tarp and it, it, it kind of turns away and it doesn't want it, I, I think that's actually much more normal behavior for tarpon. Um, but, you know, you don't have those opportunities with permit. You can't just go out early and or stay late and find a, a school of tarpon that are, you know, feeding at night and just throw a big black fly in there and hook one. Um, you know, permit are, are harder to do that with. But I, I think they're pretty honest. I mean, they're, they're frustrating and they do drive you a bit crazy, but I don't, I don't think that they're like, you know, I don't think you can do everything right very, very many times before you hook one. Yeah, and it's hard to say what the, um, where the reputation that permit have developed came from. It's certainly, you know, uh, 30, 40 years ago when people were throwing tarpon flies and, you know, even, even uh, designing permit flies from tarpon flies, um, you know, the expectation was that if you caught a fish on fly, uh, permit on fly, uh, it was about 90% luck and 10% skill. And yeah. somewhere along the way that changed. And, and now um, the, uh, the fact that uh, tarpon, in fact, probably see more flies than they've ever seen before, and they live to be such a long age. You know, it's, it's almost like the, 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 the deck has been reshuffled to some degree. I would agree with that. I, I also think that, I mean, to your point, the, the technology that we're using, um, you know, permit flies have come a long way, and, and so have tarpon flies, but... I think there was a time in like the eighties and nineties um, where if you go back into the eighties, the permit flies didn't even sink. And if, if you give, you know, if you give 10 people sort of a, a little white feathered streamer and you say, go try to catch a permit, I would say that luck would factor into that a lot. I mean, I've thrown a lot of tarpon flies at permit and I've only caught one of them. Um, and, and so I, I think that that is more luck, but yeah, the technology has changed and, um, I think people are unsurprisingly figuring out how to catch them more effectively. Um, but again, on, it, you gotta, I gotta run that numbers, that, those numbers sort of per shot. Um, if I go out on, and you tell me I'm going to get 10 shots at tarpon today and another day I go out and you say, you're going to get 10, you know, shots at permit. And these are all going to be like high quality shots. I would actually feel more confident that I would bring to hand a permit than a, than a tarpon because once you hook a tarpon now you got to fight the thing and i mean you could get two bites three bites or five bites from tarpon and they all fall off on the first jump right. and i mean that so in that way it's interesting if you look at the like the frequency that permit are caught in the permit tournaments and weight fish are caught in the tarpon tournaments um i'm not talking about a small fish where you touch the leader or something but you know a fish over 70 pounds brought to hand um those numbers are pretty equal. Like what it takes to win a, a three-day permit tournament or a three-day tarpon tournament, mm. it's the same number of permit or weight fish that it takes to win it. Um, 
And, and I've always found that to be like an interesting statistic. And it speaks to the fact that permit are not as dishonest as everyone. I mean, what's dishonest about tarpon is when you get, I had this happen to me the other day, you throw a cast and the fish comes up and he eats the fly and you set the hook really hard. The fish turns away and you're clearing the line and the fish jumps and the fly falls out. To me, that's dishonest. I don't right. like that at all. Like it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's and you there, are, of course, there's a lot you can do to head that, but it, it still happens. But the number of permit that I've lost once they were on the reel is very, very low. Um, so that in that way, I think permit are actually pretty honest. You know, you don't get, they don't jump and you don't have to like drive the hook into their mouth. You know, once you're tight to them, if you stay tight, you're, you're likely to bring that fish to hand. So as long as we're talking, we talked about fish behavior a little bit and how it's changed. What in general do you think has changed about keys fishing over the past 10 or 15 years? I mean, I think the number of boats that are here in tarpon season has, has increased a lot. Um, and, and I, this is, a, you know, probably a longer conversation, but I, the, the number of people that are, that are here for a brief period of time and, and tarpon fishing specifically from say, you know, February through June um, has really exploded and it changed the, the fishing on the ocean a lot. <clears throat> um, and that, that would be, I think the biggest, I mean, there's, there's, you know, trends, but I, I think that's been the biggest, the biggest shift that I've seen in my time here. Um, and, and it's, it's a tough thing. I mean, I, you know, it's, I, I have my own feelings about it. I'm sure people that, that are doing that as guides have their own feelings about it. Neither one of us is probably right or wrong. Um, the answer I'm sure is somewhere in the middle, but it, it definitely is a, you know, the, the amount of stress on the tarpon here during tarpon season on the ocean is it, it grows as their numbers grow and it, and it grows, I think more than their numbers do. Um, and it changes their behavior and it makes it, um, makes it harder to catch them for sure. Well, since we're encouraging people to ask questions, I'm going to throw up a question here from Todd Tanner. Sure. A uh, little bit out of order here, but um, Todd asks, other than practicing my casting with a heavy rod, what would a trout angler like, like myself have to do to prepare for my first saltwater trip to Florida? Um, so there's a couple of things. Um, I mean, the, the, the advice that I would give you, Todd, is, is uh, you know, casting practice related. Um when when you're trout fishing, you have um, a, a really long amount of time between um, seeing a fish rising and casting to that fish, uh, if you're dry fly fishing. Um, and I, I think that the, the time frame is, is really compressed in salt water. So what I usually tell people to do is, is pick a target. Um, I give a lot of lessons in the park, and there are these of bald patches where there's no grass um, and practice throwing um, on the on the left side of that target on the right side of the target and then short of the target as if it was coming at me um, and if you can get to the point where you can you can do that um, I think you'll have a better chance the other thing is that um, most people um, when they're casting they have a like sort of a favor so if, if I'm facing this way um, my easiest cast, and I think most people would agree, would be sort of at 11 or 10 o'clock where I'm casting sort of this way, diagonally across my body. Um, and it's easy when people are practicing to, to really practice with that sort of plane relative to them and never change it. Um, so another, another thing that I tell people to do is, is practice casting at, you can either change yourself, so like clock your body around relative to that plane, or you can just change the plane relative to yourself. Because if you're on the bow of a boat, um, a shot might be at 12 or 11 or 10 or 9. And the way that I cast at 9 is sort of across my body like this, where the way I cast at 12 is in front of me like this. And if the only thing that I practice is casting in front of me like this, when a 9 o'clock cast happens this way it's it's really difficult for a lot of people what they'll find they do is they sort of have to turn and then cast instead of just making a cast across their body so changing that plane angle relative to you when you're casting um it is like a real world sort of thing that happens down here that that's difficult to prepare for and it's sort of under i think it's under under practiced and sort of under discussed 
How many um, fish do you think you've caught when you've when you've cast behind the boat or in a, in a spot where you weren't even looking until somebody oh, saw it? Ton. I mean, and, and then the, the nice thing is, if you're casting at, at nine, then you're you have a really good three o'clock back cast, um, and you can practice that too. You can have a back cast at, at one, and then two, and then three, the same way you have a back cast at sort of you know ten and nine and eleven. Um, so that that kind of like shifting the the plane relative to your body. Um, is, is really important. I notice a lot of times too, like the, the boat is stationary and as the, the guide is approaching the shot, he's turning the boat slightly, which is changing the angle of the fish relative to the angler. Um, and it's a lot of times someone will start casting, you know, up here, I'm probably doing a bad job. And then as the boat turns, you know, now they're casting over here, they're not adjusting their cast as the boat is turning. Um, and, and that's something that's really particular to, to salt water. Um, and if you're in a trout stream, obviously you're either wading or you're in a drift boat and, um, it's pretty easy to, to adjust your position and then the boat's stationary. Um, so I would, from a casting perspective, that's, that's a really good exercise that, that has some, some real import if you're coming down here, um, wanting to fish because it, it, it's difficult to get on board with. Al Patkus is asking, how far is your average permit shot? 40 or 50 hey, or 60 Al. feet? What about, 100, uh, what about 100 feet? No, not 100 feet. I mean, occasionally. That's like a, no. you know, that, that, that's a, it, it, the only time that I would ever throw really far at a permit is if, if I felt like I had to. Like if a school of fish was coming and I could throw it out way in front of them. If the wind was behind me, um, the problem is accuracy is, as, as you contract distance your accuracy goes way up um so if i'm if i'm waiting probably 40 feet um from the boat i would say maybe 50 to 70 40 to 70 but, but I, I think al's right in the range there 40 50 or 60 is a, a good um you know a really good distance to, to practice at. do you think permit do you think permit have great eyesight uh as far as uh being able to see uh, out of the water, I'm sure. No, you would I, I think that I think that they. I think I don't think they're seeing out of the water. I think they feel the boat turning. I think they feel the boat stopping. Um, you know, one of the one of the the reasons to, to wade is, and, and I it took me a while to figure this out, but I can stop. You know, if I'm walking towards a fish, and I decide that I don't want to, for whatever reason, the fish stops tailing, and I don't want to. I don't want to get any, I just don't want to move. I can stop and stopping a boat, you know, the boat has to come to rest. And when it does that, it's going to decelerate and it's going to put out a lot of, um, you know, waves in the water that pressure are sound waves. waves, exactly pressure waves. Um, and so I, I think that that's more what they're picking up on. Um, I mean, if, if you, and you know, Marshall, you've seen this probably as much as anyone, but if you, you put your pole on a piece of hard bottom and it slips off, you know, you can see a fish. It's kind of just, they'll, they'll kind of just tense up a little bit. So I don't, I don't think they're actually seeing things out of the water. I think they're just really in tune with their environment. And if, if anything's out of place, they have like sort of a terror alert system. Um, a lot of times when I'm waiting, especially if it's calm and I'm walking towards a fish if, if I'm worried that that fish is going to get away from me, but it's still feeding, like I've, I've come up behind it, which is suboptimal, but um, I'll purposely throw short of the fish, maybe 20 feet. And a lot of times they kind of stop and they swim right at me. And I just pick it up and make the same cast again. And I, I've caught a fair number of fish doing that because I think they're, they know that something's there. But a fish like that that's not concerned, they don't think you're they don't think you're going to kill them. Um, you know, they'll swim over and, and I don't know that they're checking you out. I don't think they know what they're doing. They just it, to them they're out in this, you know, suspended in water and something moves and they kind of come over and, and look at it. And, and that, that happens with the boat too. You know, when when a permit spooks, often they'll come right at the boat, mm. and then they then they really spook. You know. Good point. Um, yeah. So you, you can use that to your bit, but I don't think it's them seeing you or seeing, you know, you out of the water. I think tarpon can see out of the water really well. Um, they'll see mm -hmm. the fly line in the air, barracuda too, but I think permit are not, um, 
I don't think they are built like that. But I could, I mean, I'm not a scientist, and that's just what I yeah, think. Yeah, but I mean, you're, if you look at the fish anatomy, bonefish and permit are sort of, you could say, sort of built for looking at the bottom or down at, yeah. you know, sorting through the seagrass and that sort of stuff. And tarpon and barracuda are, are, are a bit more, uh, or tarpon especially, is sort of upwardly focused in there. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, fish like a, a jack craval in the lights in, in the docks, you see them swimming upside down sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I think what they're doing is it's easier for them to look uh, down, but interesting. You know, they want to look yeah. up, so they, they flip over. And I think permit are sure. built much the same. So. Um, Al Petkus asks, what, what length leader do you prefer? And I think he's talking about permit. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I fish longer leaders, um, uh, probably 15, 16 feet maybe. Um, but I'll, I'll adjust that depending. Um, with, with a heavier permit fly, you can turn over a long leader easier. And um, I use a really long butt section. So my permit leader would have six feet of 50 pound and then five and a half feet of 40 pound and then maybe, you know, 16 inches of 30 and then, you know, call it 20 to 25 inches of, of tippet, which is usually 16 or 12. Um, and that, that same leader could be sized down. Um, I do think with a with a, a heavy butt section, it still makes a 10 foot leader easier to turn over. Um, there's no reason to just have that long leader. But I, I feel like because I don't fish clear lines usually, except if I'm barracuda fishing, so it buys me a little bit of, um, you know, it, it kind of hides the whole program a little bit. Yeah. Um, but it, it still works with shorter leaders. But I would say I, personally, I would say a minimum for for permit fishing is, is you know, I wouldn't go less than about 12 feet. Um, it, just, it just gets really hard. The other thing that can happen is with a short leader, if, is, as that cast turns over, it could come tight and then sort of shock back and, and create a lot of slack. And that's a, you know, an argument against these really, really aggressive, like heavy um, weight forward tapers. Um, you know, when you, when you have this thing with a bunch of weight traveling, as soon as it comes tight, if you don't ace the timing to redirect it, it'll come tight and it'll sort of shock back. And then you've got a bunch of slack. And once you start getting slack in the cast, um, it could be problematic. So those longer leaders help to, to sort of like flatten that effect a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and, and honestly, if you have a long enough butt section and you just adjust your timing to wait a little bit longer for it to, to turn over, um, I, I don't think they're they're super hard to throw. I think throwing a really long leader on a trout rod is, is much harder than throwing a long leader on a, a nine or a ten weight that's got a you know a, a long eleven or twelve foot butt section on it. Yeah, but you're you're being really conscious of the stiffness of that butt section too, right? Yeah, it's for like sure. a rough yeah. transition, right? Yeah, you gotta have something that, that has a similar stiffness to, to the fly line. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, cause it, you know, you're transferring, um, you're transferring energy down. Um, and, and it's not, you know, and we talked about this some the other day, it's not, it's not diameter, although it, it diameter and stiffness are often conflated. Um, like we used when we were fishing on two pound, we used really stretchy material, but it was pretty thick. It had a, a big diameter, but if, if you held it like this, it would droop straight down. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, it was incredibly soft. And you couldn't, there was no, like, you could see the loop traveling and it would hit that and it would just kind of like die. Mm -hmm. um, so we had to throw these really like big loops and, and try to get, um, to get it to turn over. Mm -hmm. um, but if you have a stiff material, um, which is why I use fluorocarbon, um, it'll be, it'll turn over better. Sure. Um, this kind of goes back to what you were talking about earlier with Alexander uh, Wonesh and I'm Apologize, Alexander, if I pronounced your name wrong. But he asked, how successful can a beginner in flask fishing be in the Keys and what fly casting skill is required? Um, I mean, it, it, that's a, a good question. Um, you know, my, my intuition, you know, at, at the outset of that is that this is a very advanced fishery. Um, and, and I don't mean that it's advanced, like, from, from what's required, but I think the fish have been educated a lot here. Um, but you can be, you can be a beginner and still catch fish here. Um, it depends on what kind of fish you want to catch. Um, I think that, um, you know, I'd, it'd be easy for me to answer that question if I knew like what level of beginner someone was. Um, but I would say, I would say pretty difficult for a beginner fly fisher to, to be successful here. Although 
a beginner fly fisher could come here and hook a lot of different kinds of fish um, and have a great time, but would they be able to catch a permit? My, my guess would be probably not. Um, the question about fly casting is, is a really good one. Um, and I talked before about, you know, setting up a target and being able to throw on the left side or on the right side or short of that target. Um, I think if, if, if someone could do that, um, the, the, the key is this, if you can start with a short line, so start your cast with five feet of line out of the rod tip and get the fly to the left side or the right side or short of a target. Um, if you could do that uh, at say 50 feet or 40 or 50 feet, you can absolutely come here and catch a lot of bonefish and have a great time and probably catch a bunch of tarpon or at least hook a bunch of tarpon. Um, and and you, you might even be able to catch a permit. Um, the problem is a lot of people, when, when I'm doing casting instruction, they make a cast and they get about 20 feet of line out and then they pick it up and they start casting again. The key is to be able to make that transition of feeding line out and then delivering it. And it's something that in, in the years that I've been doing casting instruction, it's, it's very difficult. Even when I tell someone, okay, like to see where you're at, hand them the rod and say, look, I want you to make a cast at the left side of that white spot. Um, but make sure that you start with a short line um, cause that's really the, that's where most people screw up when they're casting is that transition. And there's so much discussion about it needs to be this number of feet away that what people forget is you, you start for every cast, no matter how long you start with four or five feet of line out of the rod tip and your first couple of motions are feeding enough line out to work with and then adjusting your timing and presenting the fly. And I would say that that transition is, is more important than sort of some ultimate distance thing. Um, and a lot of people wait too long on those earlier casts, they get a bunch of slack in, or they don't wait long enough on the later casts. And it's, I would say for me as an instructor, that's the single hardest thing that, that, I, that, that there is for me to teach, which is how to get people to feed line out quickly um, mm -hmm. and, and, and get, get line out of the rod tip with the cast in the air. And when, you know, advanced casters, they do that, they, they do a lot of things, they cheat, they kind of drag the rod tip up and they fling it back and they get a lot of slack. And now they've got 50 feet of line out quickly and they're able to make a cast. Um, so practicing that transition with an eye toward, you know, picking a target, throwing again, left, right, or short of it. Um, those are real world situations. And I would say if someone can do that, even if they're a beginner fly fisherman, if you have a decent guide, they, they're gonna, I mean, their job is to make it easier for someone. Um, and they'll make sure that, that, you know, the fish are within a certain range and that the shot la lasts longer than it, you know, than it usually would. Um, but yeah, I mean, each person's different and that, that, I hope that answered the question. I, I, I know it's a long answer. Um, it, a related question, Al, Al again asks, if a permit dips on your fly in the first shot, doesn't bite and moves on, on, do you take a second shot at it? And what percentage of takes have you had on the second shot? So that's kind of related to your ability to, to not just make that first cast, but but get ready to for you know, what happens it, next, right? It, it all comes down to the, the definition of dip. Um, I mean, if if uh, <laughs> if <laughs> I feel like I feel like Clinton here. Um, but it, it does. It really does. I mean, if if a permit, um, I'm gonna fly at a permit, and the permit like runs over and looks at it really hard, and then you know, all of a sudden the fly gets pulled away from it and the fish decides to move away, I'll absolutely throw the fly again at that fish. But if, if I throw a fly at a fish and it kind of lazily swims over and, and looks at it and says, no, thank you. I mean, I might still throw at it just reflexively, but I think that's a very low probability um, thing. I, and I've, I've seen it work like, I mean, once is enough to do it forever, right? But uh but it, but I, I don't consider that a, a very big, um, I don't think that's a really high probability thing. Uh, now, if there's multiple fish, like if there's two fish and one fish does that, I'll, I'll usually try to keep an eye on the other fish and discuss it with, with my guide, whoever I'm fishing with, um, and say, you know, did, did the, you know, is the one on the left, the one that hasn't seen the fly or the one on the right. And we'll talk about that and try to show it to the fish that that wasn't the one that looked at it but typically that's that's a low uh 
a low probability that don't you, don't you think that the average angler um though uh has the experience fairly often that that they just blow the first shot yeah I mean, it's just going to happen sure. right everybody blows shots best the best right. pastors in the world blow shots but obviously with if your cast is more affected by wind or you're just more nervous or whatever it is you know um i, I think there are a large percentage of anglers who uh, I don't want to say they assume their first shot's not going to be bad. Although there's some people like that too, uh, but they 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 sort of assume, okay, this may not do it, right? right. Or somebody like yourself might say, I got about an eighty percent chance of putting this fly about where I want it to be. Right. I mean, yeah, I I think that. I mean, I kept a lot of permit on my second cast, and I'd be. I'd be interested. It wouldn't surprise me if that was like approaching 50%. Um, because you, you, I, I don't know why it is. I, I think a lot of times the shot sort of develops like that. Um, again, and, and back to Al's question, it depends on, on what the, like, if the fish lost the fly in the grass, like if he's looking for it and the fly is in the seagrass, and, and you, you know, or turtle grass and, and you pick it up and you, you know, cast off the grass and you throw again, that's a great opportunity because now he feels like he lost something. Um, but knowing when to leave it is, I think as much a part of it as knowing when to throw it back in there. And I have, I have constant, uh, let's call them discussions, uh, with, with people that I fish with, because I, I'm a big fan of leaving the fly. Um, sure. Like, I kind of feel like that's my cast and I'm just going to hold it, you know, <laughs> for out of some like sense of like, I have, like, I feel like I, I, I'm owed that that cast is going to work with the course. It's bullshit. But, um, no, I, I think a lot of times you, you, you know, you make a cast, it's not right where you want it, but giving it a second and letting the shot develop and seeing what the fish do is, is almost always the best, the best thing. And if you, if you get sort of, you know, yippy and you pick it up and you rip it out of there, then, then your chances go way down. Um, so yeah, I mean, a bad cast is only a bad cast if, if a fish didn't eat it. I mean, I, I love when I make a cast and I was with Steve not too long ago and he's a fish rolled next to the boat and he's like, you're too far away from it. And I was like, Chad was there and I was like, you know, and, and I got a bite. It may have been a different fish because I was pretty far away, but you, know, you, gotta, you gotta see it through. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, Kyle, Kyle Williams asked last discussion, Nathaniel mentioned he has used the same fly line for years to permit fish. Which line is that? Yeah, I use the uh, the Rio Tarpon line. It's not their direct core. Um, it's just their their standard uh, Tarpon line. And I think the uh, the idea behind it is so that line in, in the '80s when it was developed was very heavy because they were throwing really big, heavy like 5.0 Tarpon flies, um, and it's overweighted. But all the rods today are are much faster than they sort of like should be. Um, so the idea is that, that line is a good balance between, um, you know, casting in the wind, carrying line, making a short cast, making a long cast. And so it's sort of a B or B plus at everything. Um, direct core, the new version of the tarpon line they have is, is cool. I mean, that direct core is like a, a more, doesn't stretch as much, um, which is great, but they have this, I don't know. I hope someone from Rio is listening. They have a giant orange, right section in the line which needs to go away and then it'll be even better but the taper is great um but i am just not a fan of throwing 20 feet of bright orange anything um mm -hmm. at fish that are you know as as smart as these ones are so, yeah, what, about, the Rio, what, the Rio Tarpon line. what about permit uh and that line's available right i mean you can still buy yeah, that yeah. yeah you know it's been around for a while and what i use about, it for tarpon and permit by the way mm -hmm. I, I don't i don't change it oh interesting what about uh, speaking of changing things, your flies when you go out uh, permit fishing? And I want to ask you about tarpon fishing too. But, but sure. do you have? Um, I know you're. I've, I've heard and I, I believe that's a true story that you weigh all your permit flies on a kitchen yep. scale. Do you take it's the not a kitchen flies? scale, Marshall? It's a crack scale. A crack scale. <laughs> but that's okay. There might be children watching. <laughs> uh, but uh no it's, i weigh them on a gram scale yeah i do oh. and uh you know i try to um i try to i try to keep them you know the same weight and and I, we talked about this some a few days ago but trying to keep uh, a, a set 
quantity of, you know, how much they're going to sink and not change that is it's part of the whole thing. It's part of um, knowing what the fly is going to do, knowing what my fly line is going to do. So mm -hmm. like where, where I pick up and, and what the line can do, it's one thing to change from a nine to a 10 to an 11, um, which is about all the, those are really the only rods I fish anymore. It's nine through 11. Um, but if you start, if I start messing around with tapers or, or changing the weight of flies, it's, it's a whole new amount of information that I have to process. And I, I'll be honest, it's really, really hard to do that. I, I was fishing with uh, Ian Slater, who's a, a guy that I fish with a lot, and we fished tournaments together. And um, we were messing around with a, a fly the other day, and it, it, was just, it wasn't better or worse. It was just different. And we had, I spent a whole day being really frustrated. And finally, I think we finally had one bite, and I, I broke it off immediately, um, which was just a cherry on top of – like the worst day of fishing but but honestly we it took a long time and the next time we fished i i, I think i hooked another one and it we, we had come a long way but it's just very hard i i really don't understand how people make those um those changes in their gear like they're, they're always trying new stuff um i think it's great to try new stuff and as a fly shop owner obviously i yeah, buy all kinds of stuff and try it absolutely but um when it comes to fishing, I think it's a smart idea to consider settling on, on one thing, um, and sticking with that so that you can know what that one thing is going to do. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and weighing the flies came from that. We, John and I started doing it in 2014. And I mean, to this day, every one of John's flies, he's, he weighs them all. And I, I kind of stopped doing it because I know what they weigh at this point. Um, but like even before a tournament, I'll weigh every fly in my box and have a little piece of paper on it. So I know what it weighs um, mm. to make me feel better, I guess, at this point. Cause you know, you do, you do it enough. You sort of know what they're going to weigh. Um, sure. Yeah. Uh, Kyle Napplebaum asks, uh, how has the fishing in the Keys changed since the hurricanes? Um, I think he may mean the last hurricane, but I'm not. Cinderella. Um, you know, not a lot. I mean, this, this ecosystem is built for, um, it, it's built for storms. I mean, it was arguably it was built by storms. Um, so as, as crazy as that was, um, it, it didn't really, uh, it changed some places, um, where, you know, it, it changed like white sand. It made some places bigger. Um, but it, it really didn't do a whole lot to the fishing. Um, I mean, early on there was no one down here for two weeks um or longer i think i can't remember how long the, they were shut out from the keys the keys got infrastructurally pretty damaged yeah um no not not much at all actually hmm. um alexander uh wonish asks again uh tackle wise as a trout fisherman i do not own too many heavy rods and reels where do i start with an all-around flats setup um I would, you know, it would, the, the big question there uh, would be if you were going to do any tarpon fishing. Um, you know, I, there are three rods that I fish usually. I have a nine, a 10, and an 11. Um, and I, I think you can, you can fish pretty much the entire keys with that for anything really with, with those three rods. So I use a nine weight for permit and bonefish. Um, maybe 80% of the time I use that for permit. When it gets windy, I switch to a 10. And I use a 10 when it's calm for tarpon and an 11 when it's windy for tarpon. Um, so if you take tarpon out of the equation, um, you know, I would, I would say either a 9 or a 10. And if, if tarpon are in the equation, I would get a 10. Um, there's some great, like, not super expensive rods on the market. Um, Reddington makes a rod called the Predator, which is really nice. Mm -hmm. Um, I think Hardy is coming out with a new sort of mid, mid level. They have a, a rod now called the demon, which has been discontinued, but you can get a good saltwater rod for a couple hundred dollars, like two or $300. Um, as far as reels go, I mean, the reel is the thing that's going to fail. Um, and there, it, there aren't many good sort of affordable entry level reels out there, but Redding makes a reel called the behemoth. Um, which cast, it's not, it's not all machined. Um, so it's poured aluminum and then anodized. And they do some light machining around it to finish it up. Um, but I think that whole setup, uh, I saw one the other day, I think it's, you know, 
six hundred bucks, six fifty probably for the whole thing. Mm-hmm. I, I can't remember yeah. offhand, but that's. I, I would say, you know, without going too far down the trying to save money road and, and still maintaining some quality, that's good. Uh, a ten weight would be a really good place to start if you weren't going to do any tarpon fishing. Um, a nine is fine. It's a little easier to cast a nine, especially if you're coming from a trout background. Um, but a 10 will also make you, you know, it's a it's lift heavier weights, get stronger kind of thing. So I, I would probably say get a 10 and, and use that. I know a lot of uh, fly shops and other um, consultants, let's call them, would, would say an eight is, is a fine rod for bonefish. But uh, I've always felt like they're not really taking into we're talking about one rod right yeah. they're not really taking into account the the typical daily wind yeah. conditions on the flats and so it's not so much about the <clears throat> the weight of the line or or the size of the fish but but are you going to be able to throw that line when it's blowing 15 knots in your face or 20 knots in your face uh, right yeah yeah, I agree. Well, my dog's making an appearance. Hey, hey, dog. What's your dog's name? Uh, Cobra. Cobra is a pot cake. She's a pot cake from Turks and Caicos. Well, there you and go. That, she, that probably, she probably hasn't had dinner yet, so she's very hungry, which is why she's being so sweet. <laughs> Since you mentioned Cobra, I'll ask you about the Cobra Nagel and some sure. of your other, some of your other uh, knot inventions. I know you're a, kind of, I don't know what I call you, a knot geek. I don't know if that's fair, but... Um, We've talked before about how much of the equation when it comes to leader strength has to do with knots. And I think you agree with me that most knots, when they, most leaders, when they fail, fail at the knot. Absolutely. So I know you spent a lot of time thinking about knots and shock absorption and all that kind of stuff. You want to talk a little bit about that? About that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think in general, I mean, I, I like knots uh, because I... I mean, as someone who takes a lot of comfort in things that I can control, um, which, you know, it's unsurprising given the amount of things that are uncontrollable when you're fishing. Um, I think knots and, and building leaders and, and making them really strong is, is one thing that you can do that really has a, an impact on how many fish you catch. Um, and I, I think, you know, and I've said that I said this the other day, um, if you really want to know if someone knows what they're doing, look at their knots. Um, and there, look, there's always exceptions to that. There's some, you know, genius fishermen who have bad knots, and it's just, but those people are exceptions and not not the rule. Um, but in general, you know, a knot that's properly tied means that you're going to catch more fish. And the people that spend the time to learn how to do it, it, it indicates a certain amount of like presence and involvement in their own success. Um, and and good knots, I mean. 16 pound mason is really really hard to break um unless you do something that that you really shouldn't do um in in fact you know from so you know and i use the example of you know if you tie your leader to a fence post and it's 50 feet away at 10 pounds of pressure it's going to stretch at 10 percent so if you're standing and you and you if i hand someone a rod and say stand there and try to break it they can't. And it's not because they're not strong enough. It's because, and this is actually something that in sort of like this, this discussion um, has been lost. The reason that they can't is not because they're using the rod inefficiently. It's because there's no physical way that they can take up that slack. And the only way they could do it would be to break the rod. Um, what you can do is you can bend the rod, but at a certain point, the rod's going to fail. Um, and you have to take up five feet of slack, which you just can't do in that situation. So even if you walk straight back, like five, you know, eight or 10 feet, that's when that's going to break. So if, if, if you don't, it, once you have access to that kind of strength, you really realize how, how hard you can pull on these things and, and what you can get away with. Um, but you know, if, if you're, if you're breaking off fish, I mean, breaking off fish on 16 or even 12, it's, it, it's, it's really hard to do. Um, then there's there's something going wrong when you when you break like material, um, and I don't I don't have any leader material here, but if you if you break it, it 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 comes out all curled and, and torn up, and it's got all these like weird angles in it. It's not straight, um, and and I think that 
you know, if, if you're not seeing that kind of effect on your on your leaders when you break a fish off, it means that a knot's failing. Or you can tell, right, because the knot's there and the tippet isn't, or the, the you know, the, it, you, you know, your class was this long, and um, you know, it was, uh, um, you know, that's where the fly would be. But yeah, the the, the sure. knots the knots are going to fail. I mean, 99% of the time, unless it's a bimini in, in there. Like when people tell me like, oh, I broke off, you know, some fish the other day. And I said, well, what was it in the class? I go, yeah, every one of them was in the class. And I know they're not tying a bimini twist. Like I, I don't buy it and I, I don't want to cast stones, but that just doesn't happen, you know, right? Um, because the knot will fail unless you really go to great lengths to make it 100%, 100% of the time. Um, so that's, that's what I think about that. Gotcha. Alan Farago asks, has, it, has the let up in fishing pressure improved fishing conditions since the keys were shut down? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, that's, <clears throat> we're all, we're all talking about it. It's, uh, it's absolutely um, affecting. Um, I mean, it, it, it's hard to say how much it's affecting the fish, like in terms of whether or not they bite the fly. I mean, I think a lot of their learning is, is, you know, sort of, cumulative um and and i was a little bit disappointed to find out that like every fish wouldn't run over and eat my fly um <laughs> that, you know when i started doing some more fishing since the shutdown um but what what the main difference is is it's a lot easier to find a place to fish you can move around um whereas again like i was saying earlier you know on the uh especially on the ocean for tarpon you have so many people here that are just here for a few months and they're taking up spots um and, and the 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 sort of the way you do it is you take a spot and you got to kind of, you got to kind of live with it, you know, often for that whole day. Um, but the ability to move around means you can sort of go check this place and run over here. Um, and I think that the fish are a lot more relaxed, um, but they're still, I mean, they're still, they're not like, it's not like they've never seen a fly before. I mean, they, they know what you're doing. Um, and if they figure it out before they make a mistake, they're not going to make that mistake. Um, the main thing down here that I see is that the, we don't have the cruise ship, um, you know, sort of silt of the harbor every three times a day. And there's a lot of work that we're doing now to try to curtail the cruise ships down here. Um, but it's, that's the main difference that I've seen is without Northwest Channel getting torn up. I mean, a lot of these boats have eight inches of draft between them and the bottom mm. there, you know, at the, at the dredge. So they're, they're kicking up not just a little bit of silt, but a lot. And, you know, I understand that people make a living on cruise ships, but, and that's fine. And I, I don't hold that against them, but when that's supposed to affect, you know, the, the natural environment and the lives of bunches of guides and anglers. And I, you know, personally, I, I do think that's something we have something to say about it. And we're, we're getting ready to say a lot about it down here right now. Yeah, that's, that's a highly laudable endeavor. And uh, Agreed. I would encourage anybody who has an interest in helping with that uh, project, which is a it's a happening thing right now. It is um, uh, sort of a culmination of many years of people being concerned about what cruise ships are doing to the bottom and to the coral reef and uh, and everything else. Um, can we can we suggest they reach out to you, Nathaniel? Would that please or? please do? There's a uh, there's a website, and I want to make sure I get it right. So I'm going to look it up on my phone here. Um, it's uh, safercleanerships.com. Um, at this point, we need registered Key West voters um, to to be a part of the fight. We're we're at the stage now where we're collecting signatures to get some uh, referendums on the ballot. Um, but yeah, if, if anyone is who's watching is a registered Key West voter, reach out to me directly. I'm easy to get in touch with. Um, and if you want to help, go to uh, go to that website. Um, again, I have to look it up because I never get it right. Um, SaferCleanerships.com. Yeah, little plug there. That's great. Thanks for thanks for doing that. Absolutely, my my honest pleasure. Um, one thing I, I I I wanted to touch on before I let you go today, and that's the whole idea that you came up with of talking about this the hardware versus the software. Sure. In flats fishing. Yeah. Can you explain what you mean by that? Yeah. So it's um, I mean, in general, the the idea is that there is as much there's as much improvement to be found. Um, sort of mentally and and in terms of non-physical preparation 
as there is um, in using equipment and, and gear and, and getting you know technically proficient. Um, I would say as as I would say more work that I do these days is on the sort of mental aspect and and maybe probably the emotional aspect of fishing as well. Um, in terms of like preparation for things to happen and taking more things into account. Cause when, when I'm throwing a fly at a fish, I mean, I have one rod and I have one reel and I, you know, my, my setups are the longer I do it, the less they change. I mean, I have a Mako reel on a hardy one piece rod and a Rio tarpon line. And, and that's usually it. I don't, I don't have a lot of different, you know, arrows in my, in my quiver, but given that, that the shots are going to happen, um, in ways that are unpredictable, um, and that most of my time is going to be spent waiting for a fish to, to sort of show up. Um, and then the, the amount of time that I have to really perform in, even in an eight hour day of fishing is, I mean, not very long. So that, that, that software term that you brought up is when we've been kicking around down here for a while, which is what, what can, what can I do and what can anyone do to sort of be prepared mentally? And I, I was talking about earlier with someone that wrote the question about, you know, what can I do to practice? Something as simple as practicing, you know, turning the plane relative to them. That is a physical thing, but that comes from an awareness that that might happen. Um, And understanding how the wind affects your cast. I mean, once you have the ability to make a cast, you know, whether or not you're able to make it when it matters is become sort of, in my opinion, pretty close to the only thing that matters. Um, I mean, I, you and I have talked, Marshall, before. If you look at the last, say, you know, five permit tournaments that have happened down here, the winning casts were not, they were not some crazy, like, backhand, you know, curve hook cast. I mean, they were probably, you know, regular shots at 40 to 80 feet. But being able to do that under pressure is, and everyone's, you know, this is the buck fever thing. This is falling apart when there's fish involved. Um, so I, I think that pr- preparing for that and trying to work on that becomes um, really, really important. And I think honestly, it's in, in a lot of ways, it's more important than, you know, what, what line or what leader or what, what rod. I mean, a lot of people fit different things. There isn't a whole lot of um, agreement about what rod is best. And I, and I, look, I've, I've been selling tackle for a long time and, you know, a lot of people prefer different rods. There is no right answer to that question. Um, but, but I think everyone does benefit from sort of a presence of mind and thinking about what's happening and being, being ready for, you know, performance under a, a really um, limited amount of opportunity to perform. Um, and, and a lot of that time spent waiting, I think people can, you know, I mean, I find myself tuning out and just being, you know, being conscious of like, okay, what's happening here? Where is a fish likely to be? Where, where is the guide not looking? Where might a fish be? Um, or asking my guide, like, hey, I don't really know. Like when I fish with Steve a lot, we're in these basins and bites and up in rivers. And, you know, they're, they're, the current there is really difficult to figure out because it's not, you know, on the ocean here, like outgoing goes out towards the ocean and incoming comes in. Um, but I find myself asking him constantly, like, which way are the fish going to be facing? Because I know that the chances are we're going to see like a little blush of color. And if I don't know which side of that fish the head is likely to be at, I, I don't, I mean, that's a 50% chance that I can, you know, be throwing at its tail, which is never, never a good thing. So that's, I think that's sort of what that idea is, is, is a preparation yeah. to yeah. perform. Yeah. And I, you know, I think maybe you have to have a little experience to understand this, but um, we've, we've talked about this before too, that if you, if you see a school of tarpon coming at you from 200 feet away and there's 15 or 20 or 50 happy fish in it and they're coming right at you, it's a lot harder to make that cast, believe it or not, than it is to a fish that pops up at 10 o'clock, 50 feet away, it's moving. It's actually, it's actually technically a harder cast to make, but the execution of the cast is so much easier. Yeah. When you're kind of surprised and you don't have that time to think, you know, get your brain all roiled up and, and tensed and, you know, start worrying, all these worries come into your head, you know, you start 
that feedback loop, right? Absolutely. Or, or I mean, if you, I mean, I, I think back, uh, this is going back a couple of years, I was fishing with Ian and, you know, a, a giant permit. I mean, the thing was, of, of course, I didn't catch it, you know, so of course, I'm, I'm free to say it was as big as I want, but suffice to say it was a monster and, you know, threw a cast and the thing ate it and it, the line wrapped around the platform and it broke off. And it was just, I mean, we both knew it was likely to be the biggest permit that we'd, you know, probably maybe catch in our lifetime. It was giant. And, you know, there was very little discussion about it. It was just get, get ready and, and, you know, forget about it, put it out of your mind. And a minute later, you know, two fish went by the boat and we caught one. Um, now, granted, it was still a shame to lose that big one, but, you know, and, and I think that's an argument for what, what makes tournament fishing really hard is that those losses hurt more when you're in a tournament. My mind starts to go to like, oh, that's probably, that thing was probably X number of inches long. And, but being able to erase that stuff and be prepared and sort of ready at all times without carrying the sort of like frustration forward I, honestly, I think that that helps me catch more fish than because I, I don't think I don't think that like I'm the fish that I catch. I, I'm not doing like some crazy like ninja move. I mean, it's all it looks really. I mean, it's it's a you know a fifty foot shot, but knowing when to make it and, and knowing you know how to how to process that stuff mentally, um, I, I would say that that probably. It, it, if there is a difference in me now versus me, say, you know, six or eight years ago, I, I'd say it's, it's mostly that because I'm not, I'm not presenting a fly to fish much farther away. I'm just more prepared and, and more like calm and ready to, to perform at this. I mean, I, I, an example that I use is like, you know, if you're standing at the baseline and, you know, you know that, that eight, eight times in an eight hour time on the baseline, a ball is going to come over the net and you've got to hit a clean winner back. I mean, most of your time is spent waiting and, and that's sort of like being prepared and being ready for that at all times, but also in a way that's sustainable. I mean, you can be totally amped up and ready for an hour, but like, can you do that an hour seven or eight? I mean, you've got to think sure. about you know, the future planning as it were. Um, yeah. I think that stuff, like the more I do this, the more, um, the, the more important I think that stuff really is. Yeah. 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 Well, we'll have to continue that conversation because I'm really fascinated by that whole idea of mental preparation. And, and uh, uh, I think the more you, the more you fish in salt water, uh, especially if you're sight fishing, like you do on the flats and the keys, um, the more you appreciate how, how being um, ready uh, influences your, your success rate. Um, yeah. Well, um, Nathaniel is, uh, I'm, we're running out of time here. Is there anything else that you want to talk about today before we, uh, before we wrap it up? No, I, I think, I think we've, I mean, we've, we've covered it unless anyone has any more questions they want to have answered. We did have John Conch ask about West coast surf perch, but I'm guessing that's not in your, uh, go for it. Your um, my advice is go get them. <laughs> that's, that's always good advice <laughs> well thanks thanks a lot for your time today Nathaniel um, and thanks everybody for tuning in to Mid Current Interviews Live we'll be continuing our broadcast in coming weeks hopefully we'll have Nathaniel back and we can dig into a little bit more detail uh, about saltwater fishing um, until next time uh, try to find some uh, quiet water somewhere and uh, and do a little fishing um, and uh, be safe and be well. And uh, if you have questions that you would like uh, Nathaniel to ask after the show, if we didn't get to them or uh, if uh, something you didn't think of, feel free to send them to uh, ask at midcurrent.com or if you go to anglingcompany.com, that's Nathaniel's um, shop website. I'm sure he would be happy to take your questions there as well. Great. Thanks, Marshall. All right. Thank you, Nathaniel, again. We'll talk to Take you care. soon. Talk All to right. you soon. Bye. Yeah.